Canada's game and the world's sport, both chasing the same goals. A living wage for athletes, facilities to play in, support staff, bums and seats, sponsors. A broadcast deal. Reasonable ask, right? So what's the holdup? It's Players Own Voice in studio. I'm Anastasia Busas. I'm Signa Butler. Two hosts, two guests, one conversation, and today we're tackling women's professional sports leagues. And there are precisely zero of those up and running in Canada. But our guest today, they're working on it. In 2018, Jaina Hefford became the commissioner of the Canadian Women's Hockey League until she and other leaders sized up the broken business model, disbanded the league, and demanded more for the players. Three World Cups, Olympic bronze, a UEFA A coaching license, TV color commentator. Is there nothing Carmelina Moscato can't do? That's what Canadian soccer business is hoping. She's been tasked with building Canada's first professional soccer league. The first women's FIFA World Cup held in 91, the first women's hockey world championships held in 1990. Both sports get massive numbers at the Olympics. We only have to look to last year's World Cup uh, to see those numbers. So why hasn't a league been able to stick around? Jaina, let's start with you. I, you know, I think uh, professional leagues, uh, I think we have to up front say this is hard. It's not an easy thing to create a professional league. Uh, I think that here in Canada, in many ways, we're a little more conservative. We're a little more risk averse. I agree and I also don't agree. I get the numbers have to make sense uh, for the investors and for people involved. But, you know, I think pulling at heartstrings is not a bad way to go about it because, to be honest, um, once you start to put these ideas in front of people, look what could be. Look at the vision of a, for example, soccer um, uh, pro league in this country, they automatically, and I say they, the people that are sort of on the fence about this, they say, well, we're never going to be like the NWSL. We're already 10 years behind, arguably 15. We're never going to be like, going to be like. So comparison in this case is sort of the thief of joy here in Canada. Like we need to start just saying that it's important for our women and will eventually take on an identity of his own, of its own. And because the return on investment in like transfer fees. So say we develop and excavate one or two more really great Canadian women to go and play for our national team and represent that. Some people still don't see the value in that, but I think everyone on this call on this Zoom does. Canada poses some unique challenges when it comes to building a professional league. I mean, just look at the sheer geography of where we live. <laughs> Um, 35 million people, kind of like a small population, relatively speaking. And then I guess I don't need to mention the weather because it's completely different <laughs> coast to coast to coast. Um, but what kind of creative strategies are you guys looking at to maybe combat some of those Canadian challenges? <laughs> You know, I think the idea of Canadian pride is a big thing. We are very proud when it comes to our athletes, our sports. We show that every four years or sorry, every two years, I suppose, with the Olympics, summer and winter. Uh, but we need to find a way to support those athletes in the years in between. And um, through that national pride, um, you know, that's going to do well for sponsors. It's going to do well for the next generation of young athletes coming up from women that are going to stay in sports. Uh, overall health and active living, but also leadership and, and developing these women for the next role in their life. It may be in sport, it may not be in sport, but we all know the value of that. And um, so I think, you know, as Canadians, we need to really uh, look beyond the idea of a pro league driving revenue and, and what's it going to do for me now. It's, it's more about what's it going to do for us in the future and our society in the future. Spot on. It's a values-based uh, endeavor for sure. Uh, building Canada's next leaders. Uh, it's the right time. So we don't want to be on the wrong side of history on this one. Uh, we're in a very precarious moment where you know you're sort of making these major decisions and you're on one side or the other. That's how it feels. But when we get back to sort of the unique challenges, uh, geography and weather aside, you know what I've noticed, especially in the soccer realm, is we need regulatory frameworks. Okay, what does that mean? We need to sort of look at the scarcity of infrastructure in this country. So, for example, if you know indoor soccer is a reality for about six months on the on the East Coast, sometimes it costs a thousand dollars to rent a pitch for about an hour. So, 
you know, teams and clubs, they start to take one eighth of a pitch, which we know is not great for development. And you just sort of run a club and you do things of that nature. So when we look at the unique challenges, I think we really need to come together and at all levels, grassroots, youth, semi-pro and pro and say, this is what it's all for. And we're not going to charge you a thousand dollars. You start to separate who can participate in sport right away when you don't have those frameworks. So that's a government, that's a call to action from governments. That's a call to action from NSOs and PSOs to get involved and say, let's make these sports more accessible, which from the bottom will drive participation and hopefully at the top will create more affordability. Mm -hmm. What are the differences between hockey and soccer? Hmm. Jane, now that's a good one. <laughs> good question. Talk to some people in soccer and, and we always think soccer's ahead of us because there's an NWSL and there's European professional leagues and, and we don't have that. Um, and then you, you know, the soccer players will say, yeah, but you guys have this and you have this. And we have, um, you know, I think we're arguably Canada's sport. Uh, people, hockey is ingrained in us. So I think that's something that we have on our shoulder. Um, but, you know, I, I think we're trying to achieve achieve similar things. Absolutely. Um, and I think, you know, collectively we represent the same thing. Um, when you think about what corporations and people are trying to live by right now, it's, it's very value based, I think coming out of, you know, where we're at. Um, and female athletes have always been about resiliency. We've always been about diversity. We've always been about inclusion. We've always been about, um, you know, dreaming big cause we've had to, we rep, we are these things. We don't just talk about them now because they're hot topics. This is who we are as female athletes, and we're going to continue to push. And I think that's something together, you know, hockey players and, and soccer players in this country have had a great amount of success and I think brought a great amount of pride to our country. We really need to push this um, collectively together. Yeah, we'd love to, to work even more closely with hockey and, and, you know, even strategizing. I know, so what, what you just did, Jane, I sort of inspire me almost. I want to get this going as soon as possible, the way that you're speaking. I know I tend to speak more in technical terms sometimes, but, you know, there's something about um, us coming together and, and multiple, you know, ideas of team sports and female sport, because this, so this is a women's sport issue, right? It's mm -hmm. not particular. We don't feel that we're unique in any way, that we don't have a pro opportunity. Hockey shouldn't feel that way either. It's just putting our heads together and being creative, to your point earlier, guys, with your question. It's There are ways to do this. We just need people invested in, in sort of solving these uh, these problems. And I honestly think it is, it's going to skyrocket. The second there's a product to support, um, it'll be one of those moments in our history where we're all going to be like, why didn't we do this 10 years ago? Uh, how important is it to align with men's professional teams? And, and I know this is a question that's been tossed around a lot. And you look to the WNBA and their kind of partnership with the NBA, uh, the National Women's Soccer League, they've got associations with the MLS. So, you know, are there pros and cons to kind of, you know, getting a little bit of a, I don't want to call it a life raft, so to speak, but something like that from a men's professional league already established? As hockey players, we believe the NHL should play a role in the future of the women's game. Um, you know, with the infrastructure and the resources alone, um, that individual investment to create something like this just you know hasn't been there and, and in the past we've had these leagues that have been not for profits and and relied on donations and sponsorships we've been in private investor models and they haven't worked um we believe we need that infrastructure that you know those resources to get ourselves going um the nhl or any pro league brings this level of expertise and knowledge um that they can bring to getting this moving um you know i'm sure there's some people that that think they're there's, um, you know, an issue with giving up some power potentially to leagues like that. It, but we're not worried about that. We're worried about getting up on our feet, being supported in a way that this game can actually grow on a professional level. And in my mind, um, that has to be a part of the future of it. Yes, similarly in, in the MLS's case, I'd have to say that because it's, it's been over 20 years now that the MLS has uh, deep roots in, um, as a league and obviously newer roots in this country. But in terms of infrastructure, um, you'd have to go to where that is right now. And that's Vancouver Whitecaps, the TFCs, the Montreal Impacts. CPL's new. I mean, they're in their infancy as well. So we, it, it's not the NHL, it's not the MLS. So they don't have this huge, um, you know, financial backing in the sense where they can take on a whole other endeavor right now. You know, it, it's going to have to be its own independent um, endeavor at this point in soccer, in Canada, contextually. 
you know, we don't have the, the benefit of history here in Canada. It's new. This is all new. So uh, with that being said, I think COVID taught us a really interesting lesson this year because in, this, in Europe, for example, where some of the most developed soccer leagues are professional leagues, you know, the first thing to go when you were fully supported by the men's programs was the women's program. It's the first thing to go. So the fragility there, um, the precarious nature of fully and solely relying on a, a male counterpart club is very dangerous, in fact. We've been throwing you, you know, some questions that maybe you've heard before. So we want to stir the pot a little bit, little uh, <laughs> devil, devil's advocate here uh, kind of question, and maybe it's something that you've heard before. What do you say to people who think no one wants to watch women's hockey and women's soccer? The World Cup was, you know, 1 billion views, 1.12 billion views. I mean, yes, that's every four years. Will the domestic game get that many eyes weekly? No, uh, nobody is actually saying that. The numbers across the world don't say that, don't prove that, that, you know, every week you're going to get a million views. That's, that's kind of not what it is. Even the NWSL, they had respectable numbers. Like over, you know, as soon as it became front and center on CBS down in the States, the NWSL Challenge Cup was amongst the highest viewed in this year. Yeah. So there's something about what is the market telling you? People who don't believe, yes, you do have to go to numbers and data. That's the only way to get these people to sort of think differently who don't believe in that, but also give them a product to celebrate. Give them something to watch and then we'll have a good conversation. This conversation at times can really start to focus simply on the elite level, but I want to bring it back one step and, and just explore what having a domestic professional league does to the actual ecosystem of the sport. Jaina, let's start with you. Well, I think I touched on it earlier. A, a domestic league would um, certainly uh, strengthen our national programs, mm -hmm. which strengthens our level of national pride, which would be visibility uh, for many young girls. You know, and I look at this as a mom now who has daughters and I, you know, I, we're a sports family, but she still sees a lot of princesses, you know, a lot of male dominated shows, um, very few female athletes on television. It's getting better. Um, you know, we've recently been watching the WNBA and I have my son now yelling, put the women on, you know, he, <laughs> he could care less, right? If it's men or women, but um, we need that visibility so that young girls grow up, you know, we're sort of the the outliers i guess we grew up just defying the odds and being like well we love it so we're going to do it but i want sport for young girls to be normal you know they don't have to fight those boundaries if they want to play hockey or soccer or do ballet great but let's give them that equal opportunity to choose what their calling is yes. and uh yes and as leaders we are definitely i've you know i heard this from jill ellis recently like we are caretakers of dreams so exactly echoing what jane is saying you know as leaders as coaches that's our job and what i see for soccer is we put so much investment in standardizing the sport licensing programs you know we want to see it fully extended to the top level so grassroots all the way to pro to give that aspirational nature to these sports, to both hockey and soccer, to say, you know, if you're a really good coach and you're an elite coach, you have something to push for. So I see an industry around this. I see multiple jobs created around these, these leagues. Um, you know, when you think of, oh, there's not enough uh, great players or coaches or th that mindset that you hear sometimes, I've heard some crazy stuff. It's, it's to the point where really you're saying we don't have eight to 12 elite coaches that we can develop, that we can set that goal so high for a few people to, to really rise and separate themselves from the, from the crop. You know, really what are youth coaches fighting for right now? Can we talk about the elephant in the room, which is money, um, you know, corporate dollars, sponsorship. Uh, I want to hear your sales pitch. I'm a network, I'm strapped for cash as well. <laughs> Convince me. I can't tell you how many commercials I've seen in the last year with the hockey mom carrying the bag, putting a bag in her car. We all know that women have, I think it's, is it 80% purchasing power within the household? Um, so these companies are calling to women. They're putting young girls on television and commercials. They're putting hockey moms on the commercials, but are they investing in the sport? And I, I imagine the same could be said for soccer. So it's not just about hockey, but it's like, if these are our values, let's put action to our words. And I think that's something that as athletes, we always feel very strongly about, but I want to see that as Canadians, you know, the fact that Canada does not have a single women's professional team in any sport 
is really sad. I'm, I'm such a proud Canadian. I love, we, I think we're the best country in the world. We are so proud. Uh, but to say that we don't have a professional women's team in any sport is disappointing in my mind. It's, an, it's a new demographic. You know, you're going to be unearthing people and subscriptions and tickets and, you know, um, season tickets and all those, like you said, the purchasing power from women that uh, may not purchase it in the men's game. And plus, it's actually probably at a lower price point right now than it will be in 10 years. So it's almost like get ahead of the curve here. Women's sports not going anywhere. It's only growing, especially in soccer, astronomically, in fact, around the world with more competitions from UEFA, from FIFA. You know, it's becoming prestigious. There's going to be one point where we're on the outside looking in. That felt like we were on Dragon's Den. Good job. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Uh, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go multiple choice here. You know, Anastasia raises the bar there with uh, with that question. But uh, I'm gonna go multiple choice. A living wage, uh, sponsors, bums in seats, broadcast deals, support staff. Are any of those things kind of like the keys to the castle to building a league? Um, can you just pick one, or maybe not? You can take this first, Carm. No problem. <laughs> uh, bums and seats for me are, are based on even before, but now especially COVID for me are, is probably uh, the least of, uh, I would say, the sports worries right now. That's just mine because the old revenue models where you're just trying to bump, bump up your um, ticket sales, that may not be the way forward. I mean, broadcast and people accessing, um, you know, I just watched this whole CPL tournament when I wasn't working it. I looked at it on my phone. That's where I got, because I'm busy. We're on the go. You know, you want to watch the game. You want to hear it in the car. You put it on on the Bluetooth. Like, that's the way forward. I didn't need to be in front of a TV screen. Um, although I know there's a large demographic that wants that. So don't get me wrong. I know they're both important. So broadcast Podcast for me is one of the top because that leads to visibility that leads to people wanting to be part of it virtual stadiums now are becoming just quite normal mm -hmm. so you can get advertisements in and you know that's where sort of the most commercial opportunity looks attractive to me so I would go broadcast first uh, bums and seats last right now believe it or not uh, which really helps what stadiums we use and stuff that really <laughs> helps the whole thing um, and then in between living wages because you know you're not going to get women giving up a hundred thousand dollar salary from a great education in Canada or, or elsewhere um, if they don't have a way to support themselves so a living wage would be a close first second there for me too mm -hmm. Dana? Yeah, I, w I would completely agree with that. Um, you know, I'd, I'd like to argue and go off the board, but the idea of broadcast and um, that exposure, the visibility, I mean, it, there's all kinds of data that shows when people actually have an opportunity to watch, they will come back and watch again. Um, but to this point, we haven't had that consistently outside of World Cups or Olympic Games. Um, so great success in those events with very few resources. So if we could actually resource ourselves really well and have those consistent opportunities for exposure and visibility, uh, I think that's number one uh, following by living wage. Let's end on an upbeat note. Uh, what gives you the most optimism for the future? Karn? It's going to happen anyway. <laughs> that gives me the most optimism anyway. <laughs> so when I think that FIFA is taking the lead with, um, you know, their uh, ability to announce initiatives such as Club World Cups and new revenue generating opportunities, new commercial opera, new things to consume within the sport, it just makes you want to be part of it. Like you just say, okay, well, if that's coming in a few years, well, shoot, how do we get there? Okay, how do we participate in a meaningful way in some of these these competitions, CONCACAF, I can't imagine they wouldn't um, offer up a club tournament of some sort to honor the pro leagues that are happening in Costa Rica, Mexico, and US right now. And then you're like, as Canada, well, we should be involved. It's almost this outside pressure that's feeling like it's gonna have to happen anyway. So I just hope to contribute to some great ideas on how we do it, because I, I think it's coming. I, I don't think we can avoid it, and I hope we don't want to avoid it. <sighs> I think I get optimism from the WNBA and the NWSL. I, I see the growth, I see the success, I see the momentum they've created. Um, I know that our sport could do that too, um, but it's not gonna be easy and it's not gonna be overnight. We're looking at the WNBA in year 25 now. Um, it took someone with vision, uh, patience, investment, 
um, to see the long-term gain. And now, you know, you walk into a restaurant or a bar and you see a WNBA game on television and people watching, that gives me optimism. We've got some questions for you and speed counts, although I'm not sure there's a prize at the end of it. My apologies. <laughs> um, let's go. Let's start with Carm every time. Okay, first and foremost, okay. what's your favorite Sully? Very awkward, very awkward. Whatever comes out at the moment, um, you know, usually a pylon of some sort. <laughs> run to the, definitely running to the team because uh, again, awkward <laughs> uh, individually as well. But um, I'm such, I'm the worst person to ask. Jana, you scored a lot more goals than me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I wasn't really one to celebrate, so I'll go with my favorite move. Um, Would have been, uh, uh, on a breakaway, the uh, left, right, left, Deke. Nice. Okay. <laughs> um, next question. What scares you? What scares me is being so affected by what others think that you don't stay on your true path. So I'm working on that all the time to just be authentic and true and barrel on. But um, sort of that scares me sometimes because I, I do worry and wonder what people think. And I think it's important to just live your truths. Uh, I would say as a mom of young kids, they scare me all the time. They do things that <laughs> terrify me, um, be it uh, dangerous things. My, my son wanted to ride a bike down a steep hill, which he went down a really steep hill. He made it, but that, that was enough for me, so. <laughs> what is the best advice you've ever got? I would say John Herdman. I mean, I always mention him, I have to. He's been one of the person who's changed our lives, my life. Um, you know, surround yourself with people you trust and don't build on shaky ground. Uh, I'll go to, I don't know if it's best advice I got, but favorite quote around um, the heart carries the feet, not the feet, the heart. Um, so really the idea of, you know, being driven by your passion. And that's something that I think for me is, you know, a very young girl playing a game that most people didn't think girls should play. I I've always been led by my passion and, and hope that I can always say that. I want to know, like, who's the most, like, awkward team nickname? Like, who has the worst nickname in your, in your spheres? <laughs> I would have to probably go with Marie-Philippe Poulain, who's just known as Pooh. So, uh, you know, everybody calls her Pooh. Uh, my kids will say, when are we going to see Pooh next? And so it never, uh, it never gets old. <laughs> and kids love that. So you're just, yes, just going you're with right. It. Oh man, I mean, mine aren't that, that that's funny. Um, you know, Dynamats and D-Money, I mean, she's been D-Money forever. Uh, Melissa Tancredi, Tank, don't think she loves that, but she is a tank in life. Um, so those are the two. And uh, Keisha Bala, I mean, she named herself Keisha Bala, Keisha Buchanan. <laughs> And she earned it. I can call her Keisha Bala constantly. <laughs> She's allowed so, to. She's when you win Champions she, Leagues, you're allowed to. Whatever uh, you call yourself, I'm in. <laughs> Last but not least, what phrase do you overuse? Hundred percent. Yeah. <laughs> Big time. Probably uh, the word sustainable when we keep talking about a women's <laughs> hockey league. We always say we can't say sustainable, so what are we going to say? <laughs> Get the thesaurus out. Yeah. Yes. That's everyone's homework. Get a thesaurus. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for playing along, guys. Thanks for Happy having you. us. Yeah, thank you. Earlier this summer, we took a moment to sit back, relax, and reminisce about a moment that mattered to us in sport. Standout moment for women's sport, go. Okay, you know what my answer is going to be. So this is like this is like the softball question of all time. <laughs> uh, but, but why? <laughs> but it's the FIFA Women's World Cup. We went there last summer in France. Trip of a lifetime. And I went there with a couple of my old teammates, my old soccer teammates. Being there in France, uh, seeing Canada play against the Netherlands, it was to decide first place in their round-robin group. Uh, it, it was just... Like it was breathtaking for me um, just to see it at that level, the speed, the skill. And regardless of the result, I know Canada lost 2 1 that game. Um, seeing Christine Sinclair score, I mean, it had everything, it had all the check marks for me for a moment um, just to see how far they've come. How many croissants did you eat when you were in France? <laughs> Is that a highlight? I can't like imagine. Is it like the pan de chocolat? Yeah, I had like, uh, I had a lot and a lot of. Uh, 
a, a bubbly drink, which we will. Uh, oh, fancy. Yeah, you know what that is. Uh, no, I mean, I can't imagine. The Women's World Cup is such a fantastic benchmark to see progress, too. Like, it grows every single four years exponentially. Just looking at the TV ratings, I mean, the, the style, the speed of play. That's a pretty good answer. Yeah, I know. So, yeah, that's mine. I'm going to throw you a knuckleball because you're not allowed to say any of your moments from the Olympics. So, like, no, walking in the Olympic ceremony and the world was there and we're all united. Like, none of that. It has to be not your sport. Go. It wouldn't have been even if you didn't give me that stipulation, but I appreciate you <laughs> calling me out. Um, I almost feel weird saying it because it has nothing to do with anything that has happened on the ice. When the CWHL folded, the Canadian Women's Hockey League, of course, in 2019, the top 200 players in North America from Canada and the United States, and I don't have to say, you know, the rivalry <laughs> there, came together and formed the PWHPA for all those athletes to come together and see that unity and for them to go, we're not going to accept anything less than what we deserve. You know, we're sick and tired of playing at 11.30 p.m. and then having to go to our job at 7 the next morning. It's such a selfless, powerful act, and they are allowing kids to dream for generations to come. So that's my favorite. It's a good favorite. And like they say in sports, uh, especially in women's sports, and we know the progress that's been made, but it's you want to leave it in a better place than when you entered it. And I think two good examples. Next time, we're going to talk about politics in play. Juicy stuff, of course. What's the Canadian compromise when it comes to protests on the podium? We're going to tackle that. We know that shut up and play is gone forever, but are there limits? We want to hear your questions, so make sure you send those in. This has been Player's Own Voice in studio. I'm Anastasia Busis. And I'm Signa Butler. Thanks for joining us. Uh -huh.